All right. Now let's look at verse 9. Verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. So God's going to make this particular group Satan's synagogue. They claim they're Jews, but what? They're not Jews, but do lie. So they're lying about themselves. So whoever these fake Jews are, this is going to be interesting. Whoever these fake Jews are, God said they're going to do something. Now, this is the interesting doctrine that I'm going to show a double application. You ready for this? Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So Jesus said, I'm going to make these fake Jews one day come before your feet, worship you, and that way they can know that, what, Jesus loved them. See, one day they're going to, man, one day... They're going to kneel down, and they're going to beg in front of you. And guess who's that applying to? I'm going to show you something. So Revelation, keep this in mind. Revelation chapter 2 and verse, let's see right here, verse 9. Remember I covered that in our last Bible study teaching? These, this verse is infamously used to be an anti-Semitic verse against today's nation of Israel, saying that these are not real Jews. So a lot of people who study conspiracy and elites, because they see Jews involved with the bank system, Hollywood, and the elites, and Rothschilds, etc., that's why they think they cannot be legitimately Jews, God's people. They must be fake Jews. And they go through this Ashkenazi bloodline with the Khazars and etc., but you got to realize this, is that in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, that I prove to you that it's actually referring to those anti-Semites who claim they're Jews. Jehovah Witnesses claim that they're the 144,000 Jews at Revelation chapter 7. Uh, the black Hebrew Israelites claim that they're Jews. The Muslim nation, they claim that the real Abrahamic seed was not through Isaac, where those Jews came from. It was from Ishmael. And then you also got uh, the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, and all the other so-called Christian churches who join that denomination. They think they're the replacement of God's people, God's nation. So uh, majority, not majority, but a huge number of Christian churches today, especially if they believe in Calvinism, they believe in this heretical doctrine called replacement theology. Basically, they replace the Jews. Dispensationalists do not believe in that. King James only, Bible-believing dispensationalists, we believe that God has a program with the nation of Israel and the church. God has programs with both of them. He does not break any covenant with any of them. He doesn't say, okay, I'm going to replace one with the other. He doesn't do that. He doesn't break his covenant, his oath. So, Revelation 3, 9, it is referring to those guys as fake Jews, and I'm going to prove it right here. Let's look at the book of Zechariah. Zechariah. We're going to look at chapter 8. Zechariah. And then we'll look at chapter 8. Now, notice right here as we look at Zechariah chapter 8 that these Jews are not done. They keep insisting right here that so let's put God's people, and these will refer to two groups. One is in Zechariah chapter 8. Old Testament Jews, they're done. The Christian church replaces them. No, that's not true, because look what God says about these Old Testament Jews. They rejected Jesus, their Messiah, so God rejected them. No, God never rejected them. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 8. Now notice right here, verse 19 is speaking to the what? House of Judah, right? Mm. Now remember uh, Isaiah 22, the key of David with the house of Judah? Okay, there's a connection here. Let's look at verse 15. Jerusalem and house of Judah, right? Hey, who's in charge of Jerusalem today? Okay. So notice right here that we're talking about the modern nation of Israel today. It's talking about Jerusalem 
I mean, it said Jerusalem like a gazillion times. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 8. It's like a gazillion times it mentions Jerusalem. So these are referring to the modern day Jews today. But look at this. Look what God says about them. Remember Revelation 3, 9? These fake Jews are going to come before your feet and know that I have loved thee. Zechariah 8, 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the what? Skirt of him that is a Jew. Oh, that's why they're coming before their feet. See that, remember? They're going to bow the knee, hold their feet. Why? Because they're going to be holding the skirt, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that what? God is with you. That's why they're going to come worship at their feet, because why? They know God is with them. And to seek proper worship from God, they have to go to that modern Jew. Whoa, how about that? So, and that, so the funny thing is, this is not referring to the Jews today. This is referring to those anti-Semites who claim that they're Jews. No, they're the fake Jews, and these are the guys that are going to bow the knee to these Jews that they hate, saying, we're going to go with you because God is with you. That's going to swallow your pride, right? Well, these are wicked, evil people. It don't matter. What did God say about Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon? I'm going to use you to punish my people. They're going to get their judgment. But guess what? You're going to submit to them at the end, Babylon. I'm going to punish you for what you did to Israel, and you're going to come to them one day. How about that? God has his way of doing things that you don't like. So notice this is referring to modern Jews that time. Now, let me show you a goodie right here. Double application. Let's look at the book of Kings. First Kings. Uh, excuse me, not First Kings. It will be First Samuel. First Samuel, please. First Samuel. Second Samuel. Ah, second Samuel. Final, final, final word. Second Samuel. <laughs> Call me a pro false prophet if I'm wrong on this one this time. <laughs> Second Samuel. <laughs> now notice what God promised to David. Look at chapter 7. Chapter 7. Now this is interesting right here. God gave an oath to David, and then we're going to close it off here for the night. I mean, not the night. We're going to close it off here for the day. So 2 Samuel, David's house. And then I want your other hand to go to Hebrews 1, all right? Hebrews chapter 1. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read chapter 7 for now. Notice what God promised David. He said in verse 5, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? It's talking about the house. Verse 11, And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my what? People Israel. See, it's talking about the Jews of that time. Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. Ah, uh, he's going to make, ah, remember house of David right here? David's house? There's something going on here. What did God promise? Verse 12, and when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up, look at this, thy seed. This is referring to David's seed. Keep that in mind. After thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. forever. This is going to go forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. He's talking about Solomon's line right here. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Well, can't God give up the house of David with these literal Jews who came from Solomon's line? No. No. Because look at verse 15. But my house shall not depart away, but my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established what? How long? See? He, he didn't break his covenant with David's physical lineage right here. See, Solomon's line. These people, these Jews, they're gonna get their kingdom. They're given that key that no man can shut. Any anti-Semite, YouTube video, Google thing, Calvinist scholar, I don't care. No matter how hard you try to shut the door, God's going to keep it open. That's a house that's in there. But guess who's included? You're included. We're also going to keep, look at verse 14, huh? Look at verse 14. 
It's talking about Solomon, right? But look at this. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. The second half of verse 14 is Solomon because when Solomon commits iniquity, God chastens him. But the first part of verse 14 is Jesus Christ. I told you, you better do double application on a verse. Well, I don't believe you. <sighs> Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Well, you might disagree with me, but I'll tell you what, the Bible disagrees with you. Look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. I will be his father, he will be my son, right? Guess who's that talking about? Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, okay, so when did God ever say this, see? So that's what the verse is saying. God said this before. There's a scripture. I will be to him a what? Father, and he shall be to me a what? But that's referring to what? Jesus and God the Father. Look at verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the what? First begotten. See, that's God's line. Look at verse 8. But unto the Son, Jesus, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever. Wait a minute. I thought God promised Solomon, David's line, the throne's forever. But now he's saying, Jesus, the throne is forever. You know why God is seeing double application here? He is saying literal Jews from Solomon's line, and he's looking at us Christians. Why? Because it's from Jesus' line right here. How about that? Can I show you another goodie right here? Let's look at Psalms 89. Psalms 89. I do not believe in hyper-dispensationalism, where they think that every passage has to be a Jew, not a Christian. That is not true. Only the Pauline epistles are for Christians. Everything else, you better be careful, they're referring to a Jew. No, uh, you're wrong. You're wrong. Look, in the Old Testament, it talks about the Christian seed. Old Testament. Look at Psalms chapter 89. Psalms chapter 89. Now look at this. Look at verse 28. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Remember God gave that promise to David's seed? My covenant is going to be with you forever. I'm not going to take my mercy away from you like I, did from Saul, like I did with Saul, right? Okay, it's matching up with that. You'll notice verse 20 it's talking about David's line. I have found David my servant. See that? It's talking about David's line here. But look at verse 27. Also, I will make him my what? Firstborn. Wait a minute. Hebrews chapter 1. I will be his father. He will be my son. He is the first begotten. Now, do you want a Christian uh, verse on that one? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, Mr. Hyper Dispensationalist. It said Jesus Christ is the first fruits. See? First begotten right here. How about that? So this is referring to Jesus' line right here. I will make him my first point higher than the kings of the earth. See that? When will he rule over all the kings of the earth? This is Jesus Christ right here. But notice, talking about his seed right here, you'll notice verse 36. His seed shall what? Endure forever. Look at verse 29. His seed also, speaking of Jesus Christ, will I make to what? Endure forever. There's your verse on eternal security. That's why it makes sense about 1 Peter. You got an incorruptible seed in you. See? Who is this seed talking about? It's talking about the Christian church. It's not... Referring, oh, these are only referring to Jews. No, get that out of here, man. This is referring to the first begotten seed. Who is the first begotten seed? Who is Jesus' seed? Us. That's why Jesus said we are to be what? Born again. That's why he's the first begotten. Why? Because we're born after that from his line and his lineage. So let's review Revelation 3 then. So Revelation 3 is undoubtedly and clearly double application then. This is really good. 
you, it makes so much sense when you do double application. If you don't do that, it doesn't make sense. So it makes so much sense in double application. What's going on is this. In Revelation chapter 3, if we're going to read from verses 7 through 9, here's the totality right here. Doctrinally, tribulation saints, the Jews, God gave them the key of the house of David if they continue to be faithful and to endure. By doing that, then he will promise them entrance to rule at David's kingdom at the millennium. And no antichrist out there and no antichrist YouTuber out there and false preacher out there can shut that down and say that these are fake Jews. No, Revelation 3, 9 calls them the fake Jews. That's what it shows right here. But it also refers to the Christian church at Revelation 3, 9. They're not only going to bow down to a modern day Jew, they're going to bow to you. These people who poke fun of you at street preaching, said hail Satan and criticized you, these wicked people on CNN, MSNBC, and yes, even Fox News, it's not really a Christian channel, I'm sorry. And then all these schools out there and all these false churches and pastors who criticized you, attacked you, they're going to come down on, on one knee towards you and they're going to realize, they're going to do reverence before you. And we're, they're going to say, we know that God is with you. You guys are right. That's what's going to happen. So God's going to get victory at the end where Israel will stand triumphant and the church and all the world's going to bow the knee before Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. And guess what? Jesus Christ is going to say, uh, uh, don't get up yet. I want you to stay on the ground while Gene Kim comes before you. And you're going to have to tell him, I'm sorry for trolling you online and commenting. And you're right and I'm wrong. And guess what? They're going to call me arrogant right after that. That's okay. We'll see who's right at the judgment at the end. See? I wonder if you guys can confidently say that with a clean heart and a clean conscience. I can. Because I know what I speak is right purely from the heart from truth. Can you guys confidently do that? Or are you going by the emotions of your flesh and you want to be the one that's right? 